The debate has renewed over how to get our momentum back up into outer space. But I think it's really a good idea to step back and have a little perspective on why we would go to space. I think that gives us a little better idea about what our destinations are. There have been many that, uh, ideas that have been proposed as to reasons. We had the space race, which was all about geopolitics. We had the propulsion of things that were very, very useful to humanity. Uh, geosynchronous communication satellites, weather satellites, uh, the Earth observation satellites that are helping to s resolve uh, some of the issues about climate change, and the satellites that saved us, the military satellites, that allowed um, both sides to relax a little bit because they understood how many resources and how many bombs the other side had, so they weren't on quite a hair trigger. Um, we're all alive, I'm alive because of those. But moving on from the immediately practical, you have more of the adventure side. Uh, many people are pro-space because we want to be a space-faring people, the sort of people who would deserve contact with extraterrestrials if they were out there, or who would deserve the respect of our civilization in the future that pervades the solar system and perhaps goes on to other stars. Well, I'm all in favor of that. I'm a science fiction author, an astronomer. I, I dream with the best of them. But adventure isn't enough alone. Some people, such as Elon Musk, who is uh, propelling the new commercial uh, alternatives to uh, launching cargoes into low Earth orbit with his Falcon rockets, he and several others who are involved in this process, like Jeff Bezos and some of the other startups, <clears throat> they're taking advantage of this shift, shift to commercial launch to low Earth orbit, something we should have done a long time ago. And uh, motivated, though, for various reasons. Elon wants to reduce the cost of sending a kilogram into a low Earth orbit because that's how we'll eventually get to Mars, colonize Mars, and, as the old saying goes, put our eggs in more than one basket. Once we become a space-faring people, then there will be humans off the Earth. And they will um, be able to carry on humanity if we ever screw up this planet. Or be able to come and help the survivors if we mostly screw up this planet. So these are, uh, these are certainly practically practical but also far-seeing and a little unnerving reasons to proceed. Um, but I, I want to talk about uh, one in particular, and that is wealth. Now, already there's a huge amount of money being made from outer space. If only the weather reports were taxed to pay for the cost of developing the weather satellites in some way. Uh, that would be a funding that would go straight to space, continuing to invest in space. That is how capitalism pays for its further endeavors. Uh, if the p people of the world paid a surcharge just for being alive, thanks to the uh, defense satellites, certainly the communications, a small tariff on our phone bills would be the proper way to pay for further endeavors in near space. And there are many uh, potential uses, some of which may be necessary for geoengineering to reverse the uh, effects of global warming. It's possible that we might be able to put up a modest degree of sunshade between the sun and the earth. Just a tenth of a percent would make a difference as far as global warming is concerned. But let's get back to wealth. Um, because it's very, very much involved in where we're going next. First off, we were told during the last administration that our objective was the moon. Why? We've already been there. It's a sterile rock. It happens that my research advisor, when I was at UCSD doing my doctorate, was the one who actually predicted, Dr. James Arnold, that there would be lunar ice, that there would be deposits of ice at the north and south pole of the, of the moon in craters that hadn't been illuminated in several billion years by sunlight. If we could go to those craters, set up solar or nuclear power plants, 
and then mine that ice. We could split that ice into hydrogen and oxygen rocket fuel. We could then uh, proceed to uh, also use it for living. But the problem with that is that just developing those capabilities and then lifting the stuff off the moon winds up in total as expensive as, almost as expensive as bringing it up from the Earth. Sure, we'll probably do that, but the capabilities needed are pretty substantial. Meanwhile, are there any other possible sources of these volatiles? These volatiles, the water. Well, it turns out that comets, which I did my doctorate uh, studying, uh, are mostly water, but Extinct comets merge in with asteroids. Many of the asteroids are probably extinct comets, which means that under a layer of uh, dust, dusty material that acts as a thermos blanket, there may be a considerable amount of water and other volatile elements under the surface of many asteroids. These are the more carbonaceous type asteroids and the ones that are almost certainly watery asteroids. There are different asteroids, though, that are more stony, or of the iron-nickel type. These have all been studied by the great John Lewis, a uh, former uh, retired uh, professor at the University of Arizona, who's calculated that just one of the, of the nickel-iron asteroids could give us something on the order of a thousand years world steel production, up to a million years production of platinum group elements from our mines on Earth, and especially those rare Earth elements that um, right now are being mined in only in China, pretty much only in China, and uh, they're getting kind of a bit of a stranglehold on these uh, terribly valuable rare earth elements that are needed for all our new technologies. Even a run-of-the-mill one-kilometer asteroid could provide up to two to three times the world steel production, up to 100 years gold and silver production. The book value of the wealth of a one-kilometer asteroid, and there are millions of them, John Lewis calculates on the order of $22 trillion for one. Now, <laughs> that downplays having to get to it, creating very big solar mirrors to melt it down, the robots that would mine it, uh, transporting the subsequent material to Earth, making sure that the technologies that you develop for herding these asteroids around or moving the material around are never used by aggressive or nasty people to maybe send an asteroid toward the Earth. The number of issues involved are tremendous. The environmental impact reports would be huge. And there is, of course, this fact. Once you start delivering asteroidal-based um, iron and nickel and gold and silver and platinum and tellurium, the price will go down. There is no way that one asteroid would be worth $22 trillion unless you take into account what we're urged to take into account these days, and that is the intangible future effect upon our descendants. This is something we should have been doing a long time ago. When you dig a mine to go after gold or silver or iron, there should be a tax on it to take into account the damage done to the Earth and the depletion of resources that our descendants might need. Well, in the case of the asteroids, you're doing the reverse. You are actually removing the mining companies from tearing into our Earth because you've come up with a vastly cheaper, more prolific storehouse of these materials. The wealth that is then generated can then help us to turn the Earth into a park. Phobos may be an asteroidal type object, in which case orbiting Mars we might find an object that either has all these metals or, and or, may have volatiles like water just under the surface that could then be automatically mined, turned into rocket fuel, and providing a supply cache for all human endeavors to Mars. This has been just a quick oversight of some of the economic reasons to think about going into space and why turning our eyes instead of toward the sterile moon, which we will go back to and use at another point, but toward these wonderful treasure troves that are passing by, and by the way, energetically, 
the Earth-crossing asteroids, are as easy to get to energetically, not time-wise, as the surface of the moon. And in many ways, easier. So these are some of the reasons why we have to think in terms of possible economic benefits to the Earth and to our descendants as we start building up the capabilities that we'll need in order to be bold explorers.